Hey guys, Woodruff here. Um, now let's talk about bariatric surgeries. So bariatric surgeries are a uh, a more invasive option that patients that are uh, extremely obese, morbidly obese, um, can uh, look into or qualify for sometimes. Um, there is quite a process for it and kind of continuing my soapbox about um, obesity and um things like that um, is just that, you know, when you're uh, with, with patients like this, you know, a lot of times long battles and trying diets, nothing seems to work. Like this seems like a great option, but just as a nurse, you should be aware that um, a bariatric surgery completely changes the nutrition of a patient long-term. Now, some of them are less invasive and maybe have um, less long-term effects, uh, sorry, less long-term bad negative effects, but um, just know that for many of these surgeries, especially the common ones like the Ruan Y, um, these are going to completely alter their digestive system, the way they absorb nutrients. And so even though they do um, get to a point where they can lose weight and decrease their risk factors, and they need to do that, a lot of patients get to the point where they have no other option. Um, just know that this isn't like a, like, bam, got it. It does exactly what I need. These patients are usually chronically malnourished um, because even though now they're losing weight and they're able to get to a healthy weight, um, they can never quite get the nutrients they need to support their body. So um, believe it or not, even after the surgery, like it's like you can't win, like you're either, you know, uh, morbidly obese or, you know, you're on the other end where you're malnourished, um, but at a healthier weight. So um, it's definitely hard. But like I mentioned, uh, many patients end up having to do this because the risk versus benefit, um, the risk of all the possible health problems they can have from their obesity is a lot more than, um, um, the risk of the malnutrition that they can have after the surgery. So um, the people that can have a bariatric surgery are those that have a BMI greater than 40, um, or if they have a BMI greater than 35 in some sort of significant comorbidity, like if they have high blood pressure, sleep apnea, heart failure, diabetes, um, they could also qualify for bariatric surgery. But it's not necessarily that simple because your insurance it will usually require like multiple like proven attempts. And I don't know exactly how they have this document, but they need like documented attempts of weight loss. And they have to do extensive um, psychiatric counseling to make sure that there's not an underlying like psychiatric condition or untreated eating disorder. Um, Cause like I said too, like we're changing the physical um, makeup of your digestive tract or the way that your digestive tract works so that you don't absorb as usually we're trying to get it where you can't eat as much or you don't absorb as many nutrients or sometimes both um, with these uh, with these surgeries. Um, but here's the thing is, is if, you know, if I had an underlying um, psychiatric condition that led me to, um, you know, um, uh, what do you call it? Be like, uh, be unable to stop like with the eating or to, um, would lead me to be prone to, um, getting back into these behaviors. Like, um, I guess, let me, let me see if I can explain this different. If I have something underlying, that's going to lead me to go back to eating the way that I did, you know, prior that might've led me to my obesity. Um, and if we don't get to the bottom of that, no matter what you do to change my physical body, um, if I have the same mind that I always have, I'm going to go back to it. So the, the, what have, I've seen happen to with patients before is I'll be taking care of a patient who, um, is what do you call it? Like, um, you know, uh, like uh, this was in a rehab. I remember this one lady, cause it, it's happened many times for me, for me is I'm taking care of a patient who's had like a lap band or a Ruan by gastric bypass. And, um, they're maybe, you know, so far out and they're ordering like KFC fried chicken or pizza or other stuff. That's really like not the best foods for them. And they're eating large amounts to the point where they're, they it can actually lead to like life or death Thing. So in other words, if someone has like a mental issue or an eating disorder, um, where the, it's really not safe for them, like there's something inside of them that leads them to continue to eat and eat, and eat. they might have a binge eating disorder, they might um, be anorexic, bulimic, and I know you're thinking those people don't eat, but a lot of times they go through periods of binging and stuff too. Um, and so, um, or like people that are bulimic that, you know, eat a lot and then throw up, they can end up tearing their sutures, tearing their um, stitches or having like really serious 
um, complications as a result of this. And so, in other words, we don't want to do this procedure on someone who thinks, hey, all I need to do is just change my physical body and then I won't, I can't eat the way that I used to. Because these patients can still eat, but they can eat to the point where they literally kill themselves or hurt themselves or uh, mess with the surgery to the, um, because they're not eating in a way that's actually going to help them uh, or, or eating in a way that their body is now redesigned to eat in a different way. Um, so um, there's, a, again, it kind of goes back to the causes sometimes of obesity and um, they're in the brain, the brain can develop a reaction like to a certain amount. So sometimes I've seen patients that um, get the surgery done and there's stuff about the behavior of eating itself. Um, there's comfort in it. And um, there's like even some sadness or feeling of separation or something's wrong because they're not like they miss eating. Like there's something about the behavior of eating or um, the food. It's like they have to be able to like, even if their, their body can say, Hey, I'm full. Like if they still want to eat, some people have, um, you know, like behavioral things where it's like, I have to finish my plate that could come from their environment or maybe just their own personal ideas. Or, um, you know, again, sometimes this is like a, this is a mental and physical connection. Some people have with food, especially if you have an eating disorder, and um, as a result of that, like, I mean, there's nothing, there's no amount of reasoning, like a doctor could say, hey, if you keep eating this way, like you are going to rip your stomach open, you could die, like, it's not enough for these people. So we obviously don't want to be doing surgery on people that might have um, something in their mind that's going to stop them from being able to be eat safely and appropriately with their new digestive system with this. Now, I know that took me a while to get there. So I'm sorry. Um, and I know I'm going more in depth in this topic. Um, it's something that like, again, I've never been through this. I'm not morbidly obese or anything like that. But um, it's just something that you see a lot here in America. And you see a lot of people struggling with it. And you see a lot of people get this surgery um, that need this surgery. But you also see a lot of people get this surgery and then have complications. So um, this surgery is needed and it's good and it can help a lot of people. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that it's like completely dangerous and no one qualifies. You know, I'm not trying, I'm not trying to sell or anything, but I've had family members and I've had, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, I've had family members and I've had, um, you know, people that I'm very close and personal with and, um, that have, um, had a similar experience. And I I've seen, uh, very few people, um, get through it and have like just a positive, great experience. Like there's, it's not that horrible things happen to all of them, but it's just, it's a major adjustment. It's not, in other words, it's not as simple as just changing your anatomy to get to change how, um, like years of patterned eating behavior. So, um, just know it's a lot bigger than, than one simple thing. Um, but on the positive side, because I promise I won't always be speaking so negative, because I, I definitely um, support and see a need for bariatric surgeries. But um, I will say this is that we live in a world that looks for quick fixes and they look for something where, you know, um, a lot of times patients get this surgery and they want to continue to eat the way they were eating before, but with this new body thinking the body is going to stop them. But um, it, it, if there's the psychological component there, it's a lot. But anyway. On a positive note, um, the um, bariatric surgery can have some positive long lasting effect um, if paired with very good lifestyle changes. So they can have weight loss, but they can also reduce their risk for other problems. Like we talked about diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease, stuff like that. I'm going to try to keep my opinions out of this for now. But when I say opinions, I really shouldn't say this. This is true experience. And you know, please take this. this I know every professor has their soapboxes. You know, like I love cardiac. The obesity is my other soapbox. And part of it's my own experience having an eating disorder and knowing what it's like to have a brain <laughs> You know, that is um, very different when it comes to food and eating. Um, but um, it also just comes from seeing like so many um so many people like, you know, really get pushed to, um, you know, try a diet, a fad, or like, you know, a surgery over really getting to the crux of what's wrong underneath all of that. Like a lot of times it's, it's not just as simple. Some people it's as simple as finding a diet for them and stuff like that, but we're just in a, we're a very big society into quick, fast, um, efficiency versus what's really effective. So I would just, um, you know, when as the nurse, a lot of times you're going to be that person that's in the room, the doctor leaves and says, Hey, yeah, we should start this pill or we should do this. And a patient's going to look at you and be like, 
what do you think? Or like, what do you know about this? What experiences have you heard from this? And I'm not saying, well, let me tell you about Woodruff's scary stories about bariatric surgery. Because again, I, I'm not saying that they never, that there's lots of success stories out there and there's people that live long, healthy lives and don't have problems. Um, but there, it's just, it's just not something to take lightly is the way that I would put it. I had the same thing happen to a, pay, uh, my student was taking care of a patient one day who was going to start dialysis. And the doctor went in and told him, yeah, like everything. Um, they're like, yeah, once you get on dialysis, um, you can live the rest of your life on dialysis and he'll prove your quality of life and blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, like didn't really talk about how exhausting dialysis is. Like it's three days a week. A lot of times you feel worse um, more than you feel better. Um, it's a full-time job almost, or at least a part-time job. And um, yeah, there's a lot of consequences and serious stuff. And I was just like, man, they didn't even really go through the risks and stuff like that. And so just know it, it, it's not your job. Like it's not your job to necessarily educate that patient. But if my patient asked me my honest opinion or my experience on something, I'll share it in like, not in whatever long it's taken me to get the, the words out for this video, but I'm not in this long of one, but I'll just share my experience. Cause um, sometimes that goes a lot farther than anything. And I'm not trying to convince them of anything. I'm going to just tell them, Hey, here's, here's kind of some things like here's some pros and cons. And um, from my experience, and um, yeah, I mean, you you have, uh, believe it or not, a very, uh, very good opportunity to um, have a positive effect. We have more time sometimes to spend with patients than doctors do. So again, you shouldn't be providing primary education or risk factors, but um, we can tell people about things or um, even if nothing else, um, you know, as a nurse, after a doctor explains it, sometimes patients need a better explanation of what is the surgery going to look like? What are what's going to happen after? Um, you know, what am I going to need to do when I go home? So um, education is a big part of our role as the nurse. So like I said, there's different types of bariatric surgeries. Um, there's types that change how large your stomach is or known as restrictive surgeries. And they can do things like um, cut the stomach so it's literally smaller um, like this, like the sleeve. Um, they can also um, do things like um, the, uh, what do you call it? The gastric band, like I mentioned, that makes the stomach small. Um, they also have like intragastric balloons and things like that, that they can insert that inflate that give you the feeling of being full, um, so that you don't eat as much. On the other end, they also have what are known as malabsorptive, um, or, um, uh, what do you call it? It's a type of surgery where they pretty much, um, decrease the amount of intestines. I was like, <coughs> from being on my soapbox, I got out of breath or not out of breath. Um, I started coughing. I get, I get tired from talking when I'm on my soapbox. Um, but pretty much malabsorptive, um, uh, what do you call it? Small intestines are shortened um, or they're bypassed and um, less food is absorbed um, when it comes to, um, you know, with um, like weight loss and stuff like that. If you're absorbing less nutrients, you're usually going to um, gain less weight. Yeah, I said that right. Okay, gain less weight. So um, it can be helpful with that. And then there's some that are combination. The main one we're going to talk about is called the Ruan Y. And it's a mix of both. They make the stomach smaller. And then they also um, bypass part of the intestine. So it just leads to less absorption. So here's some pictures. Here's those balloons like we talked about. They might put one or two balloons in. And your book gives like a pretty crazy gnarly description. Like some of them, they say you swallow the balloon and then they inflate it once it gets inside of you. And I was like, oh, Jesus, no, um, <laughs> not my thing. But yeah, anyway. Um, and then um, this is a lot of, um, this is what a gastric bypass looks like. Um, they keep you, the rest of your stomach in there and your intestines in there, but you're not actually, this is like what actually, the red is what gets digested. So you have this small little pouch to eat um, food and then it goes straight into um, the jejunum and it bypasses the duodenum. Um, so you absorb less. Um, and this is another one. I can't remember if this is like something like a sleeve with a switch or something. I don't know. Um, be, I, like different acronyms are getting thrown in my head, but you can see they have some stomach, but we're bypassing the duodenum um, here. And the reason that they leave, because students are always like, why do they leave it in? Well, you still need some of this because this is, um, you still need your duodenum because it connects to where you secrete some stuff to break food down. So um, we still need it for those um, chemicals and stuff like that, but we just don't want to um, like be using it for digestion. We want to use it for its other purposes, just not digestion. 
So what am I going to do as the nurse postoperatively for these patients? I talked about in my last video on obesity that, you know, there's a lot of like really important care that these patients need. We want to make sure that we have the right size equipment for them and clothing. Um, it's it's definitely very, uh, it, it's, an, it's a lot to go through this procedure, but if you don't even have the right size gown or if you're trying to put a blood pressure cuff on them and it doesn't fit, it can be very embarrassing um, for that patient. And then you also want to think about the right size bed for these patients. And so um, for them to turn and be able to um, not have skin breakdown and also just be comfortable. Um, we want to monitor their respiratory status closely because they can be very prone to problems. So like, like I said, they're not usually taking deep breaths. They can have very diminished lung sounds. So incentive spirometry is helpful. Um, teach them about turn coughing and deep breathing um, in order to um, prevent them from getting atelectasis pneumonia, keep their head of bed elevated because they may be more likely to have aspiration, but it also helps for better expansion of their lungs for deep breathing and teach them splinting because a lot of times their incision is going to hurt on their abdomen, but we teach splinting, which is where we push a pillow onto their stomach when they cough or need to take a deep breath and it helps decrease their pain. So they'll be more likely to take those deep breaths. Um, IV access can be more tricky. Some of these patients are going to need like sono guided or sonogram guided, um, you know, IV access, um, protect their IVs closely, make sure they're working. Uh, if like, use specialists and things if you need them like IV team um, instead of sticking the patient a lot of times. Um, so definitely keep that in mind. <clears throat> um, anesthesia and medications can sometimes um, stay in like fat tissue for longer. So these patients, what you might see happen is they start to wake up. So they send them to your unit because they're like, oh, they're awake, but they come to you and then they have like a resedation. So be watching their respiratory and other stuff, especially in that immediate post-op really closely. Um, to prevent complications, we really need to get them moving, um, turning, walking. It helps, especially with abdominal surgery, um, but also just to prevent complications of immobility like DVT, skin breakdown, stuff like that too. And overall, they're going to have a higher risk of coming up with a complication. So just being super careful um, with these patients and watching and protecting their systems for them. So here's some pictures of some different things. There's larger beds um, that can help. There's uh, lifts and things like that that can help. We have bariatric wheelchairs. They also have different size blood pressure cuffs. And you want to get a gown that's going to fit the patient as well. It'll be more comfortable for them so they can heal better. So what kind of complications can you have after bariatric surgery? I said, I mentioned a couple of these. Um, there's stuff like they can have long-term vitamin deficiencies where they just can, they their stomach's not big enough for them. St not even stomach, I should say their intestines aren't long enough or they're, they're not able to absorb enough nutrients or their meals are so small after they have this surgery, they're not able to get the nutrients that they need. Um, <clears throat> they also are more prone to it, things like anemia, um, specifically what's known as pernicious anemia. We're going to talk about it on the next slide, I think maybe yeah, that we're either talking about that or dumping syndrome first. I can't remember. Um, but um, pretty much we cut out part of the stomach. And so since we cut out part of the stomach, um, the stomach makes these things, uh, has these parietal cells and the parietal cells release this thing called intrinsic factor. It allows you to absorb vitamin B12. If you do not have intrinsic factor, you cannot absorb vitamin B12. And so if I have less stomach, I have less cells secreting this thing that allows me to absorb it. So I can have a vitamin B12 deficiency known as pernicious anemia. Um, there's also... Um, Iron deficient anemia is common as well. These patients can have diarrhea because we have less space or places where actually we can absorb nutrients. So as a result of that, um, because we're not able to absorb as much, um, we're going to have more liquid stool because we have less intestines. Uh, then like uh, I was talking, I'm, I'm going to go back up. I know there's ones at the top too. Um, psychological stuff. I had an aunt that got this procedure done. And um, she got the procedure done and was so happy. She was losing weight, but then she couldn't stand looking at herself in the mirror. She had all this excess skin. And so sometimes this, this surgery leads to more surgeries, which leads to more surgeries. So they can need some follow-up cosmetic procedures. Um, they can um, also have trouble having that difference, but just like some of these patients are very, very, very obese and um, go to having a very different body image. And there's like a imposter syndrome, a syndrome that can go on. Um, aside from that, there's a, what's called a anastomotic leak. And this is where there can be like leaking at the incision site. So um, assess for these hallmark signs, look for increased respiratory rate, fever, increased heart rate and chest and abdominal pain can be your like, Ooh, something's not right. Um, and the doctor's going to need to go back in and repair that if you see those symptoms. So be looking closely for that. And we're going to talk about dumping syndrome on a different 
slide. This one. Yes, there we are. So um, dumping syndrome is something else that happens. Like I mentioned, these patients are at risk for diarrhea because they're, they have less intestines. Um, so there's two types of, of dumping syndrome. There's what's called early dumping and late dumping. And literally think of it this way, is, is that normally at the end of your stomach, you have this sphincter that's like a door that says, like, think of it like a club bouncer. If you've never been to a club, I'm sorry, but maybe we can go sometime. Um, but uh, what do you call it? Pretty much it's a club bouncer that opens periodically to let stuff in and then closes. So they take that out with a lot of these um, gastric surgeries, especially gastric bypass. And so when they, that's out, there's nothing stopping like a whole big bolus of food dumping right into the intestines. And so um, the intestines get really overwhelmed. And so what happens in early dumping is the intestines get overwhelmed and they say, I have this big old bolus of food. What do I do with this? The bloodstream tries to come and help. So it comes in and dilutes it. It brings, it takes all the fluid from, not all, I'm just being exaggerating, but you get, it takes a bunch of fluid from your bloodstream, tries to dilute it. Um, but what happens, you end up with this massive dehydration. Um, they also then, of course, there's this like um, very liquidy food that's now going through their intestines. It moves it really through really quick. So they end up having to go really bad. So they're sweating, cramping, really hyperactive bowel sounds. They got to go. What we're worried about is dehydration in this patient because all that fluid from their bloodstream went to their stomach, or I should say their intestines to dilute that extra food that the body got overwhelmed with. So the two issues I have in early dumping is dehydration and then diarrhea. So kind of think of the Ds, dehydration, diarrhea, um, and early dumping, because it's just so much and the body gets overwhelmed and tries to get rid of it, but it ends up dumping. Literally, you're going to have to get a, you're going to have to dump um, in the toilet if you don't get my, get my gist. Um, you're going to have to have a dump after you get early dumping, because it's just like this overwhelming, I got to go. And then you're worried about dehydration with some of these patients. So then late dumping, this happens hours after a meal. So again, we have this dumping of this big food bolus into the intestines. The body's, the intestines are like, holy crap, what do I do? I need some insulin because I have all this sugar in my intestines, especially, so this is why, like, we're going to talk about high carb meals are no bueno for people with dumping syndrome. I'm going to avoid that uh, or people that have had gastric surgeries and stuff like that. But anyway, um, the body is like saying like, woo, woo hyperglycemia, like send some insulin, but it overcompensates sometimes. So what can happen with late dumping? It's not, it's not to say, and I'll, I'll mention this. Some people are like, well, can you have both? Yes, you can. Um, can you just have one? Yes, you can. And um, is it all the time? It's not even, uh, not necessarily. You could have this with some meals, not other meals. You could have just early with some meals, just late with some meals. It varies, um, but it's just a problem. It just depends on your body and how it's reacting, but late dumping. So um, too much sugar, sudden dumping into your in intestines. This is hours after the meal, but he secretes insulin, but secretes too much. And what happens is you end up with hypoglycemia. So for late dumping, um, think of like all of the signs of hypoglycemia, which hopefully you remember. So dizziness, diaphoresis, confusion, irritability, hunger. This is all the um, feelings. So early the double D's, dehydration and diarrhea, late dumping is all about hypoglycemia. So which meal choice is most helpful to give a client experiencing dumping syndrome? So we have an option of baked chicken and serving of carrots, tortilla soup with pita bread and water, um, oatmeal with maple syrup and iced tea, or baked potato with butter, bacon, and sour cream. Hmm. So with dumping syndrome, there's two things you want to consider. I want foods that are not high in sugar. Um, that are going to um, be high and usually like things like fat and protein because we want to like, it's going to take it longer to digest. So I'm going to have less of that dumping. So um, I like things that have protein in them. Uh, B has a lot of carbs in it. So I don't like that. And C has some concentrated sugar. So I don't like that. So I'm kind of between a, the baked chicken with serving of carrots, or D, the baked potato with butter, bacon, and sour cream. It has some meat in it, but it also has those potatoes, which are really, um, you know, carby. I want to say carby if that's a word. Carby. Um, there's some fat in there, which is good, but I think out of all of these, chicken and vegetables is always going to be better because it's going to give you some good nutrients that aren't going to necessarily get dumped rapidly throughout you. So A is the best answer here. So how do I treat it? I don't want to overload the intestines, so small meals throughout the day. 
Um, and it helps because that's the their, their stomach is like this small. So they need very tiny meals throughout the day. Um, no fluid with their meals because if they drink fluids with their meals, they're going to fill up on the fluid instead of the nutrients. They need a like big bang for a, a lot of bang for their buck with the foods that they're eating. So we really need to focus on high quality foods for those small meals. Um, concentrated sweets and high carb meals can lead to a higher chance of dumping syndrome. So you want to avoid it at all costs. Um, not that they can't have any, but just the, like the high, high sugary foods and, um, especially those, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what was I going to say? Um, things, breads, potatoes, um, or like straight sugar foods. Uh, and then in order to meet the needs, because if we have this dumping syndrome, they could be low on some nutrients, increase protein, increase fats, and proteins and fats take longer to digest. So that's the other reason as well that we like to use those. All right, then pernicious anemia, like I was talking about, here's an ex um, here's a picture of parietal cells and look at them just secreting this little cute intrinsic factor here in the stomach. Um, and they're saying, hey, we're going to get vitamin B12, you know, so yes. So they're going to go try to get that vitamin B12 that you're trying to absorb. But if we got rid of a lot of these cells because we cut out part of the stomach or a lot of the stomach, um, the stomach is this small, we're not going to have a lot of these cells left. So um, a lot of these patients, they're going to have chronic long-term vitamin B12 deficiency. You might also see this referred to as a cobalamin deficiency. Um, so anyone who's had gastric surgery, gastric bypass is going to be at risk. Or anyone, when we talk about upper GI, we think of people with gastritis, um, people with Crohn's that have um, breakdown and injury. And Crohn's, they don't have breakdown injury to their stomach cells, but they can't absorb the same way. So I, I might need to update this to say they're, they're, you know, intestinal or stomach cells. But gastritis in the stomach, stomach's inflamed, they can't absorb as well, or peptic ulcer disease. And then Crohn's, um, we're worried about their lack of absorption. And there's also autoimmune pernicious anemia as well. So the, hall, the hallmark symptoms, we're going to see what's called a sore, red, beefy, or shiny tongue. Here's pictures here. They can have weight loss, nausea, vomiting, paresthesias, or weakness. Um, so think of those ones that are different than other ones, because some of those are general, but that tongue is going to be a very big one. And then the paresthesias as well are a hallmark. Um, so the treatment, the only thing we can do is give them IM or intranasal vitamin B12 for life because their stomach can't absorb it. So we have to bypass the GI tract. So we need to give it some other way. So this is what we end up doing with pernicious anemia is finding an alternative method. Like I said, an alternative route, IM intranasal, they're going to need it for life. You'll know it because it's usually this pink or red color. It scared me to death. One time a student's like, yeah, I gave a pink medication today. And I was like, amoxicillin and like she was like no it was a shot and I was like freaking out because I'd never given vitamin b12 <laughs> that's what it is all right so then the diet that they're going to have after surgery um just know immediately post-operative we're going to start with room temperature water and low sugar clear liquids so they start with just liquids they're literally given these little medicine cups um, and that's all they can have and they'll get like a tray that has like five or six of those little medicine cups that's all that they can drink um, or have or eat um, they can advance to a low fat full liquid diet within 48 hours if they're tolerating already the other diet um, and within four to six weeks they can get back to a normal diet but we still again have to watch out think of all those things dumping syndrome they never necessarily can go back they can't go back to eating their they can it's not that they can never have unhealthy foods but they really have to be careful because of the size issues and because of the dumping syndrome and other complications they need good healthy foods to get the nutrients they need so they don't have deficiencies um, we want to avoid straws because they create gas and like i said the the very small portions the pill cup size it's like 15 mils every 10 to 15 minutes and we gradually increase that um, Long-term, high protein, moderate carbs and fiber, um, the six small feedings a day, tell them to eat slowly, um, stop eating when they feel full and to take breaks too, because sometimes these people do not know, like, because they, they, they eat faster, they're used to eating faster. So um, teaching them to eat slower and take pauses and kind of check in with their body and listen to those signals in their body. And then, um, you know, again, to not drink fluids while they're eating solid foods. So yes, all right. I think that's it. But yeah, as a whole, like I said, so um, bariatric surgery, there's a lot to it. Um, but just keep in mind, it's it's completely changing the way that their brain is maybe wired around their eating. And then it's, their body is going to be completely different. So look for malnutrition. Um, look for those complications after the surgery. Start teaching them a way to adapt to this new lifestyle and this new way of eating and thinking around their eating. Um, and um, provide them a lot of support to 
prevent complications of immobility because they're going to be more at risk for that and prevent complications after the surgery in general, just because of their obesity. And remember, like right after that, it's not that they lose 20 pounds overnight. Um, you know, it takes time. So just helping them with their body image, psychological health, we may need to consult or work with other professionals around that too. Anyway, I think that's it for bariatric surgery. On to the next one. See you soon for metabolic syndrome.